In this diagram, we talk about how the calcium-driven curve in plasticity can drive this form of error-driven learning. And what we're doing here is instead replacing the floating threshold with the activity of the units, the neurons, M refers to both the minus phase and a medium term level running average. And so conceptually, it's a minus phase. This is the thing we're gonna be moving away from, but mathematically, it's actually a running average, kind of a floating uh, expectation that we're computing as a function of a slightly longer time constant than what we're using to drive the learning uh, activity value itself. And remember that this uh, terminology, this, this angled bracket indicates a expected value. The S indicates a short-term average that we're computing this over. And we think this is what the calcium level is being driven by. And that reflects, you know, essentially what calcium value we have when the synapse is changing. Overall direction of change is driven by that level of calcium relative to this floating average value in the BCM kind of framework of thinking about this, this overall LTP, LTD curve. And so basically because this is a linear shaped function, if you just move this floating threshold as a function of this minus phase or slightly longer term medium term uh, running average, which captures more of that expectation, that minus phase, that guess of what the network itself came up with, that actually directly ends up computing outcome minus expectation or short term minus medium term or plus phase minus minus phase. All of those things are different ways of saying this basic same equation. One thing we've done here that you can see is we've kind of multiplied through uh, by the uh, receiving unit activity to get the equation overall into this form of uh, the product of the sender times the receiver. Then fits better with the fact that we know that the calcium, which is the, the kind of Hebbian term, this X times Y, is what's actually driving the plasticity. However, there's still another problem, and we'll see this here as we, while we have this particular simulation up, what if we do the impossible task? What is the impossible task? Well, the impossible task involves a particularly diabolical pattern of, of inputs that you're trying to map onto the outputs. And in this case, not only is there kind of a confusing amount of overlap in the activities of the inputs relative to the outputs, it's actually exactly oppositely correlated, anti-correlated. So the two inputs that both map to the left output unit have no overlap, as do the two that map to the right output unit. There's nothing in common between them, and yet we want to associate them with the same output at the, at the higher level. And again, this actually is a pretty reasonable description of what happens in when we try to do object recognition, because objects can appear in different locations um, and it could be the same object, like these two connected bits could be like the same object, and you want to call them the same object, but because they're showing up in different locations, they have no actual kind of overlap in terms of the low-level input representation. So this is actually not a, an unreasonable or kind of contrived example. This actually shows up all the time. And so uh, if we go here and we try to do this same process trial by trial, training the network. We let it train. Even though we're using error-driven learning, I can just have it train from here using different random weights every time. It never works. It completely fails to work. Why is this? Is this a failure of the learning algorithm? No, it is not a failure of the learning algorithm and people really failed to appreciate this when Minsky and Papert raised the same problem in 1969 and said, oh, well, this problem, which by the way, goes by the name of the XOR problem, the exclusive OR problem. This is a version of the exclusive OR problem, this pattern of impossible input-output mappings that we just looked at. They concluded, oh, well, you can't use neural networks because they can't solve this problem, just as we saw here. 
But one thing they absolutely failed to appreciate and failed, everybody else failed to appreciate is that it's no way, it's impossible to set any pattern of weights manually to solve this problem in a two layer network. You can't do it. There's no pattern of individual synaptic weights that can be set in this network that will solve this problem. So it's not a problem with the learning, it's a problem with the network. And we now know this is trivial. If you just add an additional layer to this network, it can solve the impossible problem with no difficulty at all. However, it does require a small addition to the learning algorithm that is essentially continuing this error-driven learning principle to operate through the hidden layers. And that is known as error-driven backpropagation. And so here's the diagram. Again, we have the two different phases, the expectation or minus phase, and then the outcome or plus phase. And the key idea is that when you have changes between these two states, so you have some expectation, maybe you thought that there was gonna be a red outcome, uh, and instead it turned out that was actually a green outcome, those changes that you experience at the level of these kind of output units here, this, this place where you actually see the difference between the expectation and the outcome, those changes can percolate backwards through these synaptic connections. Again, we assume that the brain is bi-directionally connected. And as we saw in the networks chapter, that's true per, quite broadly. Um, and so those bi-directional connections, these top-down connections in particular, are able to essentially communicate this difference, this change in state between the expectation and the outcome reverberates back down to the earlier layers in the network. And this is the critical principle that in fact, just using the difference in activity between the minus phase and the plus phase at every level in this network actually produces mathematically the correct result. And that's quite an interesting outcome. Uh, the uh, further mathematics of this involve the derivation of the error-driven backpropagation learning algorithm, which can be derived by mathematically applying the chain rule from calculus to this kind of error signal that you get at the highest level and then uh, essentially using the chain rule to derive how you should change synapses down at these earlier layers in the network to minimize the overall difference or error up here at the output layer. And it turns out to be very standard mathematics, uh, very simple kind of thing you would do in high school. Uh, it took many years uh, for people to really appreciate how that solves this problem of learning in deep neural networks. Uh, Rummel, Hart, Hinton, and Williams published this result in 1986. Many people had actually published it prior to that, but the real significance and importance of this result and this ability to do error-driven learning through these multiple layers and therefore overcome the limitations identified by Minsky and Pappert in 1969, that's really what all came to, to fruition in 1986 with the publication of that backpropagation paper. Okay, and so here, is a little bit more detail about how this works. You can look at this in the appendix of the textbook, but basically you can, you can see mathematically that the backward going connections that are learned in error backpropagation can be learned through this kind of sum equation and you can compute each term in that sum separately in the minus phase versus the plus phase and, and then essentially by separating out those two components, um, you, you can translate what is otherwise a kind of error delta value that gets sent back in, in standard error backpropagation into a difference in activation states, two different activation states. And so mathematically, uh, in error backpropagation, you change the weight as a function of this kind of delta function here. But in Generac, which is the biologically plausible version of backpropagation that we're using, change the synapses down here and these earlier, deeper synapses in the network uh, directly, as we saw, is you know, the sending activity times the plus phase activity of the receiving unit minus the minus phase activity. So exactly the same learning rule. So all the math works out, and it shows that we can just use that same learning rule throughout.